Good afternoon, um, Ashley Vance. Um, very happy to have Will and Sarah here from Silicon Valley to talk some space with you guys. Um, they're both founders and, and CEOs of two of the most exciting satellite startups um, that I have a chance to cover, and so I'm glad you guys could make it. Um, the, just like an hour ago, I think SpaceX had another launch with a reusable rocket, and you know it's a, it's an incredibly exciting time in the aerospace industry. The price of rockets of launches is falling. The cadence at which rockets go up is is increasing. Um, there's just tons of competition, and then. It's not just sort of how we get to space that, that's changing, it's, it's what we do um, when we get there, and, and that's where you guys fit in. I wanted to, just before we if you explain what you do, I wanted to do one polling question, because um, I think it's gonna lead us, uh, help explain what's going on, which is around how many satellites you think are currently orbiting the Earth, because in the, the next few years, this number is gonna go up dramatically, and I was just kind of curious what the audience thought generally. Everyone thinks 50,000. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going big. <laughs> the real time like feedback <laughs> totally spoils the. Uh, so, not, I think I can give it away now. The number, it's, it's actually, so it's a little bit closer between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, satellites <laughs> are currently orbiting. <laughs> 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 and that number, that number, if you look at the launch manifest of the rocket companies and, and what a number of satellite companies have said they're going to do is, is allegedly going to go up to around 40,000 or 50,000 in the next five to ten years. And so we are about to send a lot of stuff into space. Um, and so I thought I'd kick it off with Will because planet the company that, that he helped co-found and, and runs was really the first of a new wave of satellite companies that changed the way we, we build satellites and, and the way we organize them in space and has kind of like kicked off this whole, this whole trend. Can you explain just for people who have never heard of Planet, um, you know, what you did that's different from traditional satellite companies and then what your mission is? overall. Yeah, absolutely. And firstly, uh, glad to be here. And it's, uh, it really is an exciting time for the space sector. Lots more launches, uh, lots more satellites going up. And, it, and it's a, a bit of a space uh, uh, renaissance. And, and it's, really, it's really fun to be part of. What we've been spending a lot of time on is shrinking the satellites. You see some of them flying out the back of a rocket here. You can see that we launched quite a few. Um, so they're about you, <laughs> this big, about... Yeah, they're months. about this big, so we've taken a lot of effort to shrink them. They were originally about the size of a bus, and we've shrunk them to about, about this big. And we put quite a lot into space, about 150, the largest satellite fleet ever launched, and they do this, which is each of them takes a strip of images as it's going around the Earth, so they're imaging the Earth, but by the time the next one comes down, the Earth has rotated ever so slightly so that it takes a strip next to the previous one. And so basically we've erected a line scanner for the planet. And so you imagine what you see on uh, Google Earth is an image uh, of the Earth. <coughs> it's a few years old, typically. What it might range from a year old to 10 years old, depends where you look. Uh, we are scanning the entire landmass of the planet once per day. And that enables us to see changes as they occur around the, uh, around the Earth. Uh, we also have some higher resolution satellites that can zoom in. But this is the kind of thing we see, um, uh, uh, you know, things changing around the planet, ranging from buildings being constructed, ships moving, vehicles moving. Um, what I think is most compelling when you look at our imagery is that uh, every single time we take a picture, when we compare it to the previous one, something's changed. And that change is information of value to someone and often to value to many people. And that's why uh, we started Planet, is to gra grab that data and help people to understand what's changing on the planet. Yeah, just to put things in a little context, I've written several stories about Planet. And I guess one of the things that I found really interesting is that before you guys came along, I mean, not even uh, the NSA or the, the CIA really had this type of capability. You had, you had very large imaging satellites that, that passed over um, a, a kind of limited set of targets. They, they could be aimed 
in interesting spots when needed, but, but you didn't have this capability to see the entire planet. And so it's just interesting that a, a private company came along and was there. That's right, we, 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 they, they have huge satellites that can zoom in uh, with great precision, and we have lots of little ones that do more scanning. Uh, uh, about three meter resolution, and so it's not at the highest resolution that you can see, but it, they, can't, they don't do the scanning, and, and therefore they don't see what's going on where they might not know to look. Yeah, and you guys started in 2011? Um, yeah, about then. So Planet helped uh, prove that, that you could have these large constellations of hundreds of satellites operating together. And, and since then, there's been dozens of startups that have, have tried to mimic this in different ways and, and have different approaches rather than doing imagery, maybe communications, um, which is where Sarah comes in. So can you explain a little bit? Um, Swarm's a younger company. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you could tell us you know, what, what you're trying to pull off. Yeah, definitely. So um, thanks to Will and the Planet Groups, definitely paved the way for what we were able to do. And we actually shrunk our satellite another order of magnitude. So I have <laughs> one here in my fancy uh, handbag. Um, so this is one of our quarter U form factor satellites. So we have seven like this in space. So we're a newer company, about two and a half years old. Um, let me see if I can pull this off, and it should blink a little, showing that it's alive and doing something. I mean, this is basically the smallest satellite that's ever they been. They are. So, so these are yeah. the smallest satellites in space today and the smallest two-way communication satellites ever launched. Um, and what they do is they basically provide connectivity from space. So right now, when you walk outside of cell, uh, there's not a lot of great options. You can buy a very expensive Iridium satellite phone that only billionaire investors from Silicon Valley seem to buy. Um, the rest of us are kind of out in the cold there. Um, so we're trying to solve that gap and actually provide connectivity on the remaining 90% of the Earth's surface that is currently has no connectivity today. Um, and that's a lot of different use cases that you can imagine um, across industry and then you know individuals messaging as well. So some of the industries we work in are things like agriculture, logistic, connected car, uh, energy, global development, defense, um, national security, of course. And what we're basically doing is enabling people to track assets as they're, you know, trucks going across highways or ships going across oceans where there's certainly no connectivity. And then also bringing back data, sensor data from agriculture sensors, um, you know, you name it, monitoring pumps in East Africa, things like that. We also have this capability of enabling people to do messaging through our devices. So it's low bandwidth, up to about five kilobits a second, um, but you can do really basic text messaging. Um, and we're really excited about the potential to support bringing you know, last four billion users online eventually, although we're initially starting to focus more on the kind of devices and enterprise type of thing. Can we, yeah, can I just dig in on the sure. bandwidth for a second? So the, um, I don't know how closely this audience follows space and all the goings on, but. SpaceX with Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos with Amazon, a company called OneWeb that is sort of part European, part American, mm -hmm. um, and even Facebook have announced plans. They're all at various stages of building a space internet, um, it, which is sort of this idea of surrounding the Earth with, with thousands, several thousands of, of satellites that would provide high-speed internet, like mm -hmm. sort of regular internet service um, to the, well, I guess part of the mission is the the 3.5 billion people that can't get fiber optics today, and then also still for the um, wealthier people that want um, internet in their cars or their planes. Or their yachts. Like that. Or, yeah. yeah. So, so they're doing this high-speed internet, mm -hmm. and, and, but you guys are, are, like you said, kind of on the, the total opposite end of mm -hmm. the, the spectrum. So what, like what really is the value of, of um, you know, a lower speed data service in, in this case? Like, what, what, are, what are you Yeah, doing? definitely. And, you know, I think it's actually encouraging that there's a lot of other players. It validates the market. It validates the need for connectivity on a global scale. Um, what we're really focusing on is small devices. So our tiles are literally an inch square, so like a stamp. And that's the radio modem that would go in the device. And that's very attractive for small, you know, agriculture sensors or a small device on a truck. Um, and then we're also at a very low price point. So we recently raised our Series A, actually last summer, and that's more than enough to put up our entire constellation. It's, okay, so on that, so the, the big space internet 
five billion is kind of like the yep. starting point and, and you guys raised about 20 million? 25 million, 28 total. And you think that's enough to? It's more than enough to put up that constellation you see there. Okay. And what's also exciting is you've got, we've got seven up today. We're signed up for over 150 satellites to go up. So we're gonna have that full constellation deployed mid 2020. So we're gonna be up there very quickly operating very quickly. Um, and then being able to service more of the IoT devices, low bandwidth messaging. Um, another import, important differentiator is the big players are using frequencies that require relatively large antennas. So you need a pizza box thing on the ground, probably thousands of dollars, whereas our devices are more tens of dollars or hundreds of dollars. So it's a completely different um, use case. And we actually think they're somewhat complementary. You know, we're doing the low bandwidth, low cost, tiny stuff. They're doing high speed direct to users. Okay. And Will, I mean, you guys have all kinds of interesting use cases as well. I know I've written about a bit about um, farmers that use the imagery to decide when they're gonna harvest their crops or the, the health of their fields, uh, all kinds of financial services stuff, counting, it's always the famous example, counting cars in a Walmart parking lot to see you know, how the, the shopping season's going. Um, I mean, walk me through, I was kind of curious about like what are a couple of your favorite use cases and then also you know what are the main which businesses have, have turned to this imagery yeah great question um so the main use cases that we're selling into today are in agriculture governments and mapping um so agriculture use it for precision agriculture or digital ag where um we image all of that land mass uh, 25 percent of the land mass is agricultural land uh, we can tell crop type and yield from orbit uh, in each three by three meter area. So basically that is intelligence that helps the farmer decide when to plant, when to add fertilizer, and it can improve crop efficiency anywhere from sort of 10 to 50%, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and uh, the government use cases a wide variety of things, ranging for, from border security and monitoring coastlines for illegal shipping through to um, helping to uh, respond to disasters. Uh, so we work with the Office of Emergency Services in California, for example, on responding to the fires, both understanding where the fires are to help the fire responders, but also understanding the fodder for future fires, um, floods, earthquakes, all the same. One of the most important things we provided that no one has in disaster response is that quickly before people were after a disaster were scrambling to take images oh there's a flood quick let's get a plane up take a picture or what have you and not only do we have pictures really quickly uh, but we have the picture from the day before because no one else thought to take the picture the day before of course and so and then what they had was they had a picture of that site five years earlier but then they don't know what's really changed uh, and what's what buildings are down or roads are affected or what have you um, and then in mapping, it's, it sort of stands to reason that people want to have more up-to-date satellite imagery layers on their uh, maps. Uh, there's lots of exciting new use cases in finance, insurance. Um, some of the most interesting use cases that come up recently, just to give you a couple of like specific examples, we, we work with a New Zealand company that is looking at agriculture, and they're actually using it to measure the grass heights in all their fields and then from that determining where to put their cows. And I was like, wow, that's, that's a new one. And uh, uh, there was another one that um, we're working with the Humboldt County, which is infamous in California for um, growing a, a large volume of a certain uh, substance that you more, might smoke. More, and, uh, more famous, not infamous. You know. yeah, more famous, yeah, sure. Um, and they, uh, but, but you still have to get permission to, to, uh, to have these farms. And uh, it turned out that most people didn't have permission because I guess they, that's not their style. <laughs> and, uh, and so <laughs> these, this county used our imagery to check in on whether people have permission and then, then 10x the amount of fines they did. Now, I'm not sure if I agree with this. You know, anyway, we we'll get into that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I should mention that the data is also used for a wide range of humanitarian use cases, and honestly, that's what drives me the most. I mean, tracking on deforestation in Brazil. Um, our data last year was used in many courts of law, fining millions and millions of dollars worth of fines because where the government could argue the case that deforestation was done on this land, and therefore um, they find the landowner who takes, has to bear responsibility in Brazilian law, for example. That's the key to stopping deforestation. And so the fact that we can see that every day, uh, the, track the deforestation actually will help prevent uh, deforestation. And one last example, um, 
Uh, we've just been working with uh, the uh, Allen Institute, well, uh, Vulcan Institute, which is Paul Allen's um, uh, philanthropic arm, and they ha asked us to map all the world's corals, uh, which we dutifully did and wanted to do, and basically uh, it's the first classification of all the different coral types, how they're doing, uh, how deep are they, what type of corals, and now uh, we're revisiting them every day to track and see if there's any illegal fishing or early signs of coral bleaching um, that then could lead to some sort of response. So um, that sort of work is, of course, uh, super important if we're going to um, help, help this planet. And I, I wanted to make you do one more example. Just as a reporter, I found Planet really interesting as, as kind of this accounting system for the, the Earth, um, mm. um, sort of finding truth when, when people don't always want truth to be out there. Uh, you, North Korea, I think just three or four weeks ago, did a missile test and it was, it was kind of fascinating. You guys actually had, a, your satellites pass over each spot like four times a day? One time what? a day, um, we take a picture, although they pass over twice, um, day and night. And then we have a separate fleet of satellites that goes four times per day, but uh, yeah. So this one had actually caught the plume of the, the, the missile, and that's just one example. I mean, it was, it was kind of fascinating yeah. you caught that, but there was... Uh, the North Koreans didn't expect that. Yeah, <laughs> and then between, could, could you walk me through the story between India and, and Pakistan recently and, and how that played yeah, out? Yeah, um, so basically uh, the, uh, there was some tension, and especially just before the election there, so, so it's somewhat political, but essentially our role which is unbiased observers, is that um, uh, th 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 there had supposedly been um, some fighter jets sent in to bomb a particular terrorist cell in Kashmir by the Indians, um, and Reuters asked us to look at the imagery to see if we could uh, uh, take a picture at high resolution of this site to see if that indeed had happened. We took a look, and um, it seems that the Indians had missed uh, the site. Um, Reuters... Uh, uh, asked for that picture and did that analysis, um, but it, that of course was big news both in Pakistan and in India. And there was some pressure on you to to not publish the image. Yeah, and and you know this is this is where it's very interesting. Under international law, anyone can take a picture from space uh, without their permission. If you're in um, air, if you're in air territory, so up to 100 kilometers is the territory of a nation, and then. Uh, so it goes up from the side of the country, and then above that is international territory. And the Russians and the Americans early on in the, in the, uh, in the uh, space race, and then subsequently it became international law, that there, there was an agreement that anyone can fly over anyone's territory and take a picture. Um, it's a little bit different if you want to send data down because people want to um, uh, have landing rights and things that you have to get uh, regulatory permission for. But if you're just taking pictures, they can't tell you not to, and, and it's both because you can't very well come up to Russia and turn left, you know, you're in, you're in an orbit, and you know, <laughs> there's this guy called Newton, figures some certain things out, and turns out that that's right, and you keep going, you know, and uh, so you're going to go over, and the other second thing is we're a long way away, I mean, we're 500 kilometers away, and so it's not like you can zoom in and see a personal, or take personal privacy, or, or so sensitive stuff. Um, we're, you know, it's really about wide-scale change, and so uh, it wasn't deemed as security sensitive to the countries, and so they let each other take pictures, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, they, they can ask, but we're, we're not taking pictures down if, if someone requests. Okay, and um, I wanted to sort of broaden things out a little bit. Uh, you know, from that first question I asked, we have one or 2,000 satellites going around the Earth now that... that depending on how the business models of all these companies shake out, could get up to, to 40,000, 50,000 um, in a, a pretty short amount of time. Um, SpaceX put up the first 60 or so satellites of their space internet a couple of weeks ago, and, and even though we've known all this was coming for a while, that was the first time I saw a reaction in the press and with astronomers saying, you know, they're ruining the night sky, and, and so, I mean, w what do, you, what do you think as this, this incredible number of satellites might be coming? Is this, um, you know, is this like a fundamentally good thing? Obviously, we can, we can do all these new, um, we have, can apply all this new technology up there, but, but it is a pretty big question of, of sort of the, the heavens changing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're seeing hundreds of satellites being launched. You guys have launched over hundreds. 
300, 300 something. Yeah. yeah, we're planning to put up 150. Um, and there's this really interesting dialogue, or at least there has been a dialogue in our community for a long time around orbital debris, um, being you know responsible citizens of space. And that's something that we think a lot about. We talk to the FCC and the other regulators about. We talk to our friends and colleagues about. And I think the key thing is there's kind of this like fear-based gut reaction of like two satellites are going to collide and like that'll end everything because it'll be millions of pieces everywhere. Um, and realistically, when you look at the numbers, which I always emphasize when I'm talking to um, regulators, I'm like, this is an analytical thing that we should be actually running the models and numbers for. And you see that the probabilities of collisions are extremely low, like way higher than you know car crash statistics and things like that that actually happen here on Earth. And more importantly, um, most of the satellites are maneuverable. So I know the planet satellites are maneuverable. Uh, next generation swarm satellites will be able to change their attitude, therefore changing their drag, therefore slightly changing their orbits. Even future ones will have propulsion, and a lot of satellites are starting to have this. Um, and we track everything very accurately. So we know where a planet satellite is, where a swarm satellite is. If there's any chance that they're even going to come within hundreds of meters, we do a maneuver to basically make that chance zero. Um, and the modeling and tracking capabilities are getting even better. So, you know, I think there is certainly a limit, but I also think that just using the tools and capabilities, we can really prevent a lot of the kind of gut-based emotional, um, you know, response people are having to probabilities of collisions and polluting the skies. Well, it will, like, I mean, were you surprised that the astronomers who must have known all this stuff was coming <laughs> suddenly, um, got, got you know, just said this. SpaceX had already ruined the night sky? Well, first, a bit of context. Um, that, you know, the, the, there's estimated to be about 30 million pieces of uh, objects orbiting the Earth that are man-made. Um, and you might think, what the hell is that? I mean, we only got one or 2,000 satellites. Um, uh, I guess we have a fair, fair percentage of those. And, uh, they, uh, and these objects w range in size from pieces of dust to old rocket bodies to old satellites. And actually, you know, just, so just from a numbers game standpoint, the number of satellites is going to have to get into a lot bigger numbers before it starts affecting the number of objects in low Earth orbit. So the main collision risk for the long longest time is going to be debris on debris. And that was created primarily from the history of the space age where the Russians and the Americans primarily launched lots of stuff, didn't think about the, put them in very high altitude orbits where they're very long lived, hundreds of years. And before they come down due to atmospheric decay. Uh, we've made sure we put our satellites, and I'm sure Swarm is doing the same, really low so that they come down anyway because of atmospheric decay. So these aren't contributing to the problem. The problem is actually sort of in the 800 to 1200 kilometer orbit band. That's where most of the satellites are. And it's also contributed by when a few countries have blown up satellites, which or their satellites had some fuel in it and they accidentally blow, blew up. Either way, when things blow up, it's not good. That's when you get really lots of pieces. And unlike in the, on the ground, uh, these pieces do live for a long time. It's like you have a car crash and then the pieces of the car just carry on at 70 miles an hour along the road for the next you know, 100 years. That's really annoying. You know? <laughs> So that doesn't happen in the air, it doesn't happen on the ground, but it does happen in space. And so we have to be more careful stewards. And just like climate change, the sooner you nip these things in the bud, the sooner you stop the exacerbation of this runaway effect that we've seen happening in now in, 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 in these slightly higher low Earth orbit. Uh, anyway, the astronomer's concern, however, back to the, your original point, um, I, I, look, there's many brighter objects at the present time, so I'm not quite sure and why they're suddenly getting concerned. Um, you can certainly predict well in advance where they're going to be, and therefore what's normally happened with astronomers throughout you know, the last decades of having satellites has been that they would look out, outside of that. Now, if the, you start getting more and more bright objects, it does get harder, so there's no question there's a conflict ultimately in the optical spectrum where these things reflect. But... Um, I'm surprised it's suddenly become a problem. It doesn't seem like there's anything untoward that's happened or changed that I understand. But I, I need to talk to my astronomer friends to really understand <laughs> why they're, they're getting upset. So uh, let me not speak too much for them. Yeah, it, uh, for the next question, I, I wanted to set this up with a poll as well. Um, I think we have one, you know, for a while, Elon was talking a lot about Mars, and then suddenly the, the moon has, has come back in, in vogue again with, with uh, our, our presidents wanting to go to the moon, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and also Jeff Bezos looking there as well. So I think 
um, this would be sort of a choice on, on who is, is most likely to set up a colony either on the moon or Mars um, with, with actual, China's this friend we know. actual humans in it. So, and Will, I know, so you, <laughs> you used to work at NASA and you actually did. Uh, you didn't even give them the credit of putting them on the list. <laughs> but okay, yeah, yeah, what about So that? you used to work at NASA and you actually worked on, on some missions um, looking for water on the moon and, and potentially a, a lander. And I know this is a topic of interest to you. I mean, how likely is a human colony on the moon in, in like what sort of Time time. time. Yeah. Okay, yes, this, uh, how many hours have you got? This is a topic of ex <laughs> much excitement. Um, uh, yes, so, uh, uh, yes, firstly, there is this trend back towards the moon. I mean, I, n I was always obsessed with the moon, so I never got distracted by Mars, but, but yeah, and, and there's lots of reasons for that. It's so much easier. It's an eight month travel time to Mars, so sending humans there is really painful. You can only go every couple of years. There's only a slot when the Mars and the Earth line up, so it's every two and a half years you can send anything at all. And then you're either stuck there for days or two and a half years and ten days. <laughs> well, um, you know, if something happens in the middle, that's annoying. And, <laughs> and the light travel time to the moon is one second. The travel time to the moon is a couple of days. You can go any day of the week. It's really easy. It's much more practical. And the only delta was that there was a bit more resources, we thought, on, on Mars. So when I was at NASA, we sent a couple of probes to the moon to check on a couple of those important <laughs> resources. One was water. And with the 72 missions have been sent to the moon before we sent this little probe called Elcross. Um, and we're looking for water on the poles and none of the previous ones had looked on the poles um, so none of those 72 prior missions and when we looked on the poles when we impacted the little crater on the south pole uh, we've discovered loads of water and the reason is essentially the moon uh, rotates on an axis almost exactly perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic so the plane of the earth and the system around the sun uh, unlike the earth which is tilted at 23 degrees um, and so, which gives us the seasons, right? So the moon is locked like this, and we put this pro into a crater. In these craters, it's permanent shadow because literally all year round, it will never see the sun. So where we impacted had been in the dark for two billion years, and it was 40 Kelvin temperature, so minus 230 degrees C, so pretty chilly. And uh, there, uh, water had landed. So in this case, probably came from comets. We're actually not quite sure. It could be primordial or comets. Uh, there's a theory that all the water on the Earth, or most of the water on the Earth, came from comets. And similarly, it would, from an early bombardment, if that had hit the equatorial regions of the moon, it would have sublimed off into space. If it hit the poles, it would have just stayed there, frozen in these craters. So we found lots of water, uh, found lots of CO2 and methane and other light hydrocarbons, nitrates. Very interesting. It, it, and uh, really exciting from an exploration standpoint because it means that uh, we can, uh, water is of course the main consumable. And, uh, and actually the, now, because it has no atmosphere, you don't want an atmosphere when you're going uh, to set up a settlement, that, especially if you can't bloody breathe it. I mean, that's really annoying. So, <laughs> because the atmosphere is what stops us getting up and down off this planet. It's so painful to get up and down off this planet because of the atmosphere. If there was no atmosphere, we'd just have a rail gun up to whatever velocity and send it off, but you can't do fast things in the low atmosphere. So when you're a space-faring species, basically you want to get rid of the atmosphere. That's annoying now. It was really great for the evolution phase, not good for the space phase. Anyway, so the moon is like the best destination. It's got all the resources nearby. And, and to answer your question about timeline, I mean, we could go from zero to having a self-sustainable settlement. That means it can do everything itself on that surface um, uh, for maybe 10 or 15 people for a couple of billion dollars in maybe uh, eight or 10 years, which is just amazing, right? Uh, we could back up all of life and all of uh, human knowledge. Uh, we don't want to go the way the dinosaurs did, and, and there's lots of science that we could do there, and there's many other reasons to do that. And if it's a couple of billion dollars, shit. I know friends that could do that with a spare change, so you know, we may as well, uh, may as well get These going. These guys? <laughs> yeah, those guys, for some of them, yeah. Yeah. It's, Sarah, I know you were a, you're an astronaut in, in training, a Canadian well, astronaut. Well, not exactly. <laughs> you were. <laughs> I was the, a candidate. Yeah. And uh, are, you a, are you a moon or a, a Mars person? I mean, I agree. We haven't discussed this before, so maybe, <laughs> maybe there's going to be a heated exchange. Yeah, yeah. Mars and moon is a 
is, is a tense topic within the space. Yeah, community. and I work to JPL, so we send things to Mars yeah. very regularly. I would say he's probably right from a practical perspective, but other than seeing the Earth, I think the moon would be pretty boring. I think Mars would be sufficiently more beautiful to visit. Um, but several more years out and several more billions of dollars. Um, so, yeah, but I'd go. You would go? Either one. Yeah, yeah. Would, you would. Uh, what about like one of these SpaceX rockets where they're saying you could uh, do a couple laps? Oh yeah, the, you would... that's definitely my plan. I'm not gonna be in the first like 10. That's what I meant. Are you worried about this? <laughs> you, so you, you wouldn't go on the first, you wouldn't I would definitely run the numbers. I get my, far, my smartest uh, mathematician friends yeah. to like compute my odds and once it had gone down sufficiently, yeah. yeah. After 10s had gone, what about you? Yeah, I'd definitely go, uh, but it's not my priority. I want to see it happen, but I don't have to go myself. Yeah. I mean, it would be cool to see the Earth from that perspective. I mean, that, that would be simply amazing. Yeah. The, uh, I'm going to throw up one more poll question because we're starting to get short on time. This is a fun one that just kind of plays off of uh, some of the stuff. By the way, it's going to be private before China. It totally goes wrong. You think it'll be private before China? But China's been, they've just been so active on... on yeah, but there's only one rocket on the planet that can take people to the moon right now, and uh, it's called the Falcon Heavy. Yeah. And it's in SpaceX hand. It's going to go there, and it's going to happen. The Chinese don't have a sufficiently large rocket. It takes a long time to develop rockets. They've got a steady program. They'll get there before NASA will, but they won't beat Elon. So this question is, if, if we all end up with space forces in this, this coming era, who's going to have the coolest <laughs> uniforms? I, I know Elon wants, wants to have them, but this is, this is more national. Uh, the coolest uniforms? Yeah. Where's Canada? I'm totally with them with Russia. They've got the coolest <laughs> uniforms. I apologize for excluding Canada from our, from our poll. I'm deeply offended. <laughs> Um, Sarah, so what's, you know, the most immediate use case that you think Swarm is, is going to do? I, I know we've talked a bit about cars in the past yeah. and things like that. I mean, what do you think will be, like, like as specific as you can be about um, for this type of data service? Yeah, certainly. So a lot I can't talk about, but what I can talk about is our relationship with Ford. So Ford is super interested in when vehicles go outside of cell range, you have a car crash, you want to you know, call emergency services, um, being able to do that all over the world. So it's, it's basically like there should be no excuse for you getting in a car crash and 911 isn't accessible, or emergency services aren't accessible. Um, so we're really excited about that and I think that'll probably be one of the biggest, um, quickest rollouts. Um, also on the national security, there's tons of really interesting use cases that I'm sure we can all imagine tracking assets and sending messages back. Um, off internet, for example, very exciting. Um, so I think that'll come really quickly after too. And tell me if I'm making this up, but I, th I thought we talked one time about, uh, and also this idea of like a private network that companies kind of want to be off the public internet. And, totally, and, and yeah. So what would, be, I mean, I can see some obvious examples, but but what are what types of companies are looking? Yeah, I mean, when we met the CEO and CTO of Ford, they were like, "We want our own network," and we're Why like, just <laughs> "Okay." To, just to so I think um, the main the main reasons are first, it's affordable. It's never been affordable for someone to contemplate having their own private network previously, and we raised twenty five million, more than enough to deploy. You can kind of do some simple math there. Um, so it's very exciting because people want prioritized access, they want security of their type, you know, whatever that means for encryption or key management, um, and they want you know, it to be private. They don't want anybody else being able to talk to their satellites and route data through um, the system. So it's just super attractive to know you always have that resource to be able to um, access and have your, your data prioritized. On our commercial network, everyone will be competing for access, right? So agriculture sensors will be beeping away, um, cars will be beeping, container ships, people, um, and you, there may be some delay with that, right? Because we have to queue people according to prioritization. And to know that you have that resource that's always there, always works, um, is, is really attractive to a lot of these yeah. people. This is a, it's like a Cold War uh, uniform contest. <laughs> uh, this is kind of funny, though, because I don't even know if Russia will have a space program in, in uh, a few years. But, but they uh, may have sexy uniforms. <laughs> That's all, all that we left. Well, when you, you, you were at NASA and then um, you kind of got the idea for Planet there and, and, and proved out that these small satellites could work, I mean, did you envision something like 
sw swarm coming, you know, that they would get smaller and smaller and, and that we would have all these different use cases? Was that obvious to you, sort of where things have, have gone? Yeah, I mean, so far I think most of the use cases uh, m m make a lot of sense, sort of a priori. I mean, um, and definitely this is, that was one of the ideas we contemplated actually uh, <laughs> early on. I don't know if we mentioned that, but, but it was, and I think it's a good one. Um, and there's lots of ideas that don't make sense, so, and I wouldn't be a <laughs> Ashamed to tell you. Um, <laughs> on stage. Uh, on stage, yeah. Uh, no, but because um, a, a lot of uh, us space geeks, and we're both space geeks, um, want to do space almost no matter what, you know, whether it makes financial sense or otherwise. So you're trying to build a spaceship and get yeah. it up there. And not many people scrutinize their plans with actually, is it, does it going to make sense from a business standpoint or what have you? You have people talking about asteroid mining. Cool in principle a long way off, like really long way off, you know, and like not a fucking business plan. So, um, you know, there, there's a little bit of a gap between practicalities and realities in space in our community a little bit. But no, I think this is a really good idea and there's, there's, there's many others. I mean, it's a green field of opportunity. I mean, as we mentioned, you know, launch costs are going down and, but uh, 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 although not very much yet, um, yeah. actually, it hasn't really hit. Um, over the last 30 or 40 years, launch costs have stayed roughly about the same. The frequency is, uh, I mean, well, back frequency in the day... Frequency is about the same because, yeah, in the, in, in the 70s, uh, the Russians were launching like 100 launches a year themselves. Like in some ways, we've um, just and, caught up to where we yeah. used to, to be. But, yeah. but what can you can stuff inside the payload fairing of a rocket has changed dramatically, not by 2x, by like... 200x or 2,000x. We've shrunk the satellites, orders of magnitude. That is, you know, and, and that's why people struggle with the, what's going on here in space. And um, sometimes people uh, ask me for an analogy, and and they might jump to the Model Ford, Model T Ford, as a new way of doing cars. And actually, interesting. I look back at the history, and that was only two to three times lower cost than the lowest cost cars at that time. So we're not there. We're talking about a much more radical shift. Um, and it's much closer to mainframes, to desktops in the compute, uh, computer industry, uh, where things change dramatically. And there's going to be all sorts of different new use cases as a result. So, you know, I think there's going to be a plethora of us uh, doing these kinds of things. Um, I think a lot of tr uh, there'll be at least 10 times that many proposed, because it's really hard still to put stuff in space and make it work. But, but there's a lot of green field for opportunity. Well, just so we only have like 30 seconds left, and I just wanted to get so if you guys could be quick on this one. And to your point, I mean, over the last. I got the hint. Yeah. Over the last three years, there's been about $30 billion that's gone into this market, so it's, and, and uh, all kinds of crazy business proposals. So, like, five years from now, are we, you know, excited about space still, and there's all this activity, or, or has there been sort of a reckoning? Uh, well, we'll always be excited about yeah. space. <laughs> um, no, I think it's just becoming more and more exciting. Um, access to space is increasing. Um, the number of launches that we have access to, at least in the last five years, has increased dramatically. But also, you know, we're controlling where rockets are going to put our satellites into desired locations. The miniaturization of electronics, like our phones, are considerably more sophisticated than most satellites in space. Um, and that, those are only getting smaller, and all those technologies will go into satellites. So I, can, I see it continuing to get super exciting. Um, communications, imaging, you know, all sorts of crazy use cases we can't even imagine yeah. right now. And five years from now, same thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of what we're seeing now will have come to fruition. It's, there's lots of bright, shiny objects right now, but in, in five years, this is going to be affecting our daily life. Just like everyone uses space and they don't know, like GPS and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, satellite TV and all these things in their lives. All these things that we're working on now are going to be embedded in people's lives and have a large impact uh, in five years. And, and so I think it's going to be exciting times from here. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, the audience and to Will and Sarah. Thank no you. worries.